new reigns. Protesters in Bangladesh rallied behind Nobel laureate Muhammad Yunus to form a new government. Escalating riots. UK police prepare for another night of violence as the unrest surges across the nation like never before. Team on the trail. Kamala Harris and Tim Walls hold their first rally together, gearing up for a busy few months before audition day. Pause on waves. The World Dog Surfing Competition sees professional puffers showing off their skills on the water. All that and more as World is Tonight starts right now. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening, you're joining us on World News this Wednesday evening. From the riots in the UK to the tensions in the Middle East, we have lots of key updates to bring to you tonight. President Vladimir Putin has accused Ukraine of launching another major provocation after defence officials said around 300 Ukrainian troops crossed into Russia's Kursk region. Fighting is reported ongoing in the area as Moscow said troops supported by 11 tanks and more than 20 armoured combat vehicles crossed the border near the town of Sudza, 10 kilometres from the front line. Thousands of people have left their homes in the region. Ukraine has yet to comment on the Russian allegations. Speaking ahead of a meeting at the Security Council in Moscow, Putin accused Ukrainian forces of firing indiscriminately at civilian buildings and residencies. A Nobel laureate known as the banker to the poor will aim to bring stability to Bangladesh after he answered a call by student protesters for him to temporarily lead the rest of country following weeks of deadly anti-government demonstrations. Bangladesh's Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina resigned and fled the country on Monday following weeks of deadly protests. They began as student-led demonstrations against government job quotas, but they quickly surged into a movement demanding both Hasina's resignation and that her arch-rival, a Nobel Prize winner named Mohammed Yunus, helm an interim government. Yunus has accepted the request, but what do we know about him? Yunus has been called the banker to the poor and a pioneer of the global microcredit movement. Microcredit lending is the idea of extending small loans to very poor people, often small business owners. Yunus and the Grameen Bank he founded won the 2006 Nobel Peace Prize for helping lift millions from poverty by providing microloans to Bangladesh's rural poor. Their lending model has since inspired similar projects around the world. And Yunus started Grameen America, focused on U.S. women living in poverty in 2008. As his success grew, Yunus flirted briefly with a political career and attempted to form his own party in 2007. His ambitions were widely viewed as having sparked Hasina's ire, who accused him of, quote, sucking blood from the poor. His critics have also said his micro-lenders charge excessive rates and make money off the poor. But Yunus said the rates were far lower than local interest rates in developing countries. Hasina's government removed him as head of Grameen Bank in 2011, saying that at 73 he had stayed on past the legal retirement age of 60. Thousands of Bangladeshis formed a human chain to protest his ouster. Yunus was already in the spotlight this year, facing a slew of legal troubles. He was sentenced in January to six months in prison for labor law violations. Then in June, he and 13 others were indicted on charges of embezzlement from the Workers' Welfare Fund of a telecoms company he founded. Though he was ultimately not jailed in either of those cases, Yunus still faces more than 100 other cases on graft and other charges. In the June interview, Yunus was openly critical of Hasina and the state of Bangladeshi politics. Following Hasina's exit, Yunus told Indian broadcaster Times Now that Monday, August 5th, marked the, quote, second liberation day for Bangladesh after its 1971 war of independence from Pakistan. Still in Asia, a Thai court has ordered the dissolution of the Reformist Party, which won the most seats and votes in last year's election, but was blocked from forming a government. The ruling also banned Move Forward's young former leader Peter Lim Jarorant and 10 other senior figures from politics for 10 years. The court rolled its campaign to amend a law that protects the monarchy from criticism, risked undermining the democratic system. The decision comes around six months after the same court ordered Move Forward to drop its plan to reform a law on royal insults, ruling it was unconstitutional. In a unanimous ruling that cited the court's January decision, the judges said Move Forward had improperly used the monarchy to gain an election advantage. 
putting the palace in conflict with the people. The monarch is enshrined in the constitution as being in a position of revered worship, and the palace is seen by royalists as sacrosanct. Perceived insults of the monarchy are punishable by up to 15 years in jail. The disbandment of Move Forward, which won most seats in the 2023 election, is the latest setback for Thailand's major political parties that are embroiled in a two-decade battle for power. But although the dissolution is likely to anger millions of young and urban voters who backed Move Forward and its progressive agenda, the impact of the ruling is expected to be limited. The party's surviving lawmakers will keep their seats in parliament and are expected to reorganize under a new party. Move Forward has repeatedly denied seeking to undermine the royal family. It had no immediate comment on the ruling. Over in the UK, where the riots are continuing to escalate, police are preparing for more possible riots across England, with reports at least 30 protests would be planned for later today. According to the police sources, nearly 6,000 officers have been mobilised. The country is bracing itself for more scenes like this. Police are aware of 30 gatherings and are preparing for a day of disorder. An extra 2,200 riot-trained officers are being deployed to confront whatever comes next. After days of a fray on the streets, the Prime Minister chaired a second meeting of the Emergency Cobra Committee. Over 400 people now have been arrested, 100 have been charged, some in relation to online activity, and a number of them are already in court. And I'm now expecting substantive sentencing before the end of this week. There are dozens already in the court system as a result of the unrest. Many more will join them. And these are the faces of some of those who have already pleaded guilty. Among them, 21-year-old Bradney Mackin, who admitted violent disorder and possession of cocaine and heroin. He was arrested after what police said was serious and sustained violence when hundreds rampaged through the centre of Sunderland on Friday night. And some have been sentenced. In Manchester, 18-year-old James Nelson jailed for two months for smashing the windows of police cars during a disturbance in Bolton. Sunday's attack on a hotel housing asylum seekers in Rotherham, condemned as terrorism by a former police chief who once led the country's response to the issue. The sentencing of some of those who admitted rioting where violence first erupted in Southport has been brought forward. The unrest has its roots in the town where just over a week ago, Alice De Silva Agiar, BB King and Elsie Dot Stancombe were stabbed to death in a brutal attack. This service for Alice was the first of many memorials and ceremonies for a community in mourning. It ended with a balloon release and a chance for the people of Southport to embrace loved ones. This family and two others have suffered losses that are unimaginable. Updates on the war in Israel now. Hamas named its Gaza leader Yahya Sinwar as successor to the former political chief Ismail Haniye, who was assassinated in Tehran last week in a move that reinforces the radical path pursued since the 7th of October attack on Israel. Sinwar, the architect of the most devastating attack on Israel in decades, has been hiding in Gaza, evading Israeli attempts to kill him since the start of the war. News of Sinwar's appointment came as Israel braces for a likely attack from Iran following the killing of Haniyeh in Tehran. It may also reinforce Israeli leader Benjamin Netanyahu's insistence that Israel must pursue its campaign in Gaza to the end. Meanwhile, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken said a ceasefire must be the primary goal. With regard to um, uh, Mr. Sinwar, um, he has been uh, and remains the primary decider when it comes to concluding uh, a ceasefire. And so I think this only underscores the uh, fact that uh, it is really on him uh, to decide whether to move forward with a ceasefire that manifestly uh, will uh, help so many Palestinians in desperate need, women, children, men, who are caught in the crossfire of Hamas's making in Gaza. Sinwar, who has spent half his adult life in Israeli prisons, was the most powerful Hamas leader left alive following the assassination of Haniyeh, which has left the region on the brink of a wider conflict after Iran vowed harsh retaliation. Israel has not claimed responsibility for the assassination, but it has said it killed other senior Hamas leaders. Born in a refugee camp in the southern Gaza city of Khan Yunis, 61-year-old Sinwar was elected as Hamas leader in Gaza in 2017 after gaining a reputation as a ruthless enforcer among Palestinians and a ruthless enemy of Israel. 
Israel's chief military spokesman, Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari, blamed Sinwar for the October 7th attack and said Israel would continue to pursue him. Still on the conflict, the leader of Hezbollah pledged a strong and effective response to the killing of its military commander by Israel last week, no matter the consequences, and said Hezbollah would act either alone or with its regional allies. In a televised speech on Tuesday, the leader of Hezbollah promised a strong and effective response to the assassination of its military commander by an Israeli strike. Said Hassan Nasrallah said the Lebanese Shia militia group would wait for the right moment to respond, but did not hint on its form or timing. And he said all international attempts at persuading Hezbollah not to retaliate were futile. There was no comment from the Israeli military. A July 30th strike killed Fuad Shukr in a Beirut suburb. He is the most senior Hezbollah figure killed in nearly 10 months of conflict with Israel. <laughs> Nasrallah's promise of vengeance comes amid rising fears that the Middle East could tip into full-blown war. Hezbollah is the most powerful regional militia armed and equipped by Iran. Iran has promised to retaliate after an explosion in Tehran killed Ismail Haniya, the political leader of the Palestinian Hamas Islamist group. Iran blames Israel. Israel has not claimed responsibility for Haniya's death. Hezbollah earlier on Tuesday said it launched a swarm of attack drones at northern Israel. A Reuters video filmed drones over the city of Nahariya. Israel said two civilians were injured. While Nasrallah spoke, plumes of smoke were spotted over the Israel-Lebanon border. The White House on Tuesday said U.S. President Joe Biden spoke with the leaders of Qatar and Egypt to discuss efforts to de-escalate tensions in the region. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. And on the road to the White House tonight, Kamala Harris and her newly selected vice presidential running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, campaigned for the first time together in Philadelphia, kicking off a multi-day tour of battleground states aimed at introducing Walz to the national stage. It's how America's election looks now, and it's different. On a Philadelphia stage, this was the black woman running for the presidency. Governor Tim Walz of the great state of Minnesota. And this was her running mate revealed. A leader who will help unite our nation and move us forward. A fighter for the middle class. A patriot who believes, as I do, in the extraordinary promise of America. I found such a leader. Tim Waltz is the liberal-leaning candidate who came from behind. My high school class was 24 people. I was related to half of them. He's the former teacher, national guardsman, and current governor of Minnesota. Hi, this is Tim. Waltz got the call because of his chemistry with Kamala Harris and his plain speaking. Would you be my running mate and let's get this thing on the road? I would be honored, Madam Vice President. On this double act's opening night, we saw both. His running mate shares his dangerous and backward agenda for this country. And I gotta tell you, I can't wait to debate the guy. This was the start of a tour of battleground states in the city of Philadelphia, home of the Rocky movies. Yes! Where else for the party lifted off the canvas? On the same day, in the same place, there was the shadow boxer across town. J.D. Vance, the Republican's vice presidential pick, is copying his opponent's speaking schedule. It's where the political rally meets guerrilla warfare. Kamala Harris is running as a San Francisco liberal. She is governed as a San Francisco liberal, and she's chosen a running mate who will be a San Francisco-style liberal. Are you ready to look the next President of the United States in the eye and say, hello, Madam President. On a day of oratory, no one outperformed the Democrat who didn't get the job. 
Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro was the hot tip that Kamala Harris burned. Rejecting the popular governor of a must-win state could well be the gamble that defines an election campaign, win or lose. Change has done them good. How good will be a test of time and Trump? There are some interesting poll numbers to bring to you tonight. Former President Trump has moved into the lead among Jewish voters in deep blue New York. Trump garnered the support of 50% of likely Jewish voters in New York, according to a CNN Research Institute poll. A slight lead over Vice President Hallis, who garnered the selection of 49% of respondents. While the lead for Trump is slim, it marks a dramatic change from the former president's prospects against President Biden, who in June led Trump among likely Jewish voters, 52% to 46% in the state. The poll comes just as Harris chose Minnesota Governor Tim Walz over Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro, who was the only Jewish candidate in the running. The move prompted some to speculate that the choice was made as a result of Shapiro's lack of popularity with members of the Democratic Party, who have taken a more sympathetic approach approach to Palestinians since the war broke out in Gaza. Nevertheless, Jewish voters have traditionally supported Democrat candidates for decades. According to an analysis by the American Enterprise Institute, Jewish voters have on average supported Democrats over Republicans by a margin of 71% to 26% since 1968. Jewish voters supported Biden over Trump 68% to 30% in 2020, while 2016, the same group chose Clinton over Trump by a margin of 71% to 20%. 26%. On to the Boeing's blowout problems now. Boeing said it plans to make design changes to prevent a future mid air cabin panel blowout like the one in an Alaska Airlines 737 MAX 9 flight in January that spun the plane maker into its second major crisis in recent years damaging its reputation and throwing production into chaos. The new pledge came during the first day of hearings by the National Transportation Safety Board. A Boeing executive said the firm hoped to implement the design change within the year and then retrofit it across the fleet. Speaking at the hearing, NTSB Chair Jennifer Homendy said the company's safety culture still needs a lot of work. Inadequate record-keeping by Boeing means watchdogs haven't figured out what went wrong with installation of the door plug that blew out. However, two workers thought likely to be involved have been placed on administrative leave. Production of the MAX jets remains constrained while Boeing takes steps to improve quality. Last month it said it would buy back key supplier Spirit Aero Systems, which makes the fuselage for the planes. A company executive said that, before the blowout, Every fuselage it received from Spirit had come with defects. July also saw Boeing agree to plead guilty to fraud charges over two earlier MAX crashes, which were traced to a design flaw. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. The World Dog Surfing Competition returned to Pacifica, California this week. Fans came out to watch about 15 dogs take to surfboards in a competition with very few rules. Safe to say they had a ball of a time. They came from all over to Lindemar Beach to catch a glimpse of a wonder of nature. Not the whales, although they were here too, but something even more amazing. Dogs on surfboards. But this is way better than what I was expecting. <laughs> it's adorable. It's, I was saying it's like the happiest place on earth. The World Dog Surfing Competition was back in Pacifica. About 15 surfing canines showed up to compete for a title that no one really worried about. There were four divisions, small, medium, large, and extra large, which included Rip and Rosie. Her owner, Steve Drotter, is a lifelong surfer who says Rosie lives to be out on the waves with her buddy. 
There's not that many people that actually get to surf with their dogs, and the people that do have such an amazing bond, and it's a gift. The competition has judges, and they insist there are things they actually evaluate. Some do tricks, some, you know, have costumes on, so it's a wide variety. So basically there are no standards. It's just whoever is the most fun to watch. Whether we win or not, tomorrow morning, Rosie and I will be surfing at Pleasure Point together. <laughs> so we win no matter what. Few things in life bring more joy than having a dog. Yeah, but it seems like some dogs have more fun than others. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We'll see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. Stay tuned as Anuradha Vikramasinghe will join you next for the nightly business report. Thank you for watching. Good night.